Um, welcome back to lesson three. Um, so we're going to start with a quick correction, uh, which is to let you know that when we referred to this chart as coming from Quora last week, we were correct. It did come from Quora, but actually uh, we realized originally it came from Andrew Ng's excellent machine learning course on Coursera. Uh, so apologies for the incorrect citation. But in exchange, let's talk about Andrew Ng's excellent machine learning course on Coursera. Um, it's, uh, it's really great. Uh, as you can see, people gave it 4.9 out of 5 stars. Um, in some ways it's a little dated, um, but a lot of the content really is as, uh, as uh, appropriate as ever and taught in a more bottom-up style. So it can be quite nice to combine Andrew's bottom-up style and our top-down style and meet somewhere in the middle. Uh, also, if you're interested in more machine learning foundations, uh, you should check out our machine learning course as well. If you go to course.fast.ai and click on the machine learning button, that will take you to our course, which is about twice as long as this deep learning course and kind of takes you much more gradually through some of the foundational stuff around validation sets and model interpretation and how PyTorch tensors work and, and stuff like that. Uh, so. Um, I think all these courses together, if you want to really dig deeply into the material, uh, do all of them. I know a lot of people who have and end up saying, oh, I got more out of each one um, by doing the whole lot. Or you can skip backwards and forwards, see which one works for you. Um, so uh, we started talking about uh, deploying your web app last week. Um, one thing that's going to make life a lot easier for you is that on the course V3 website, um, there's a production section where uh, right now we have one uh, platform, but more will be added by the time this video comes out, showing you how to deploy your web app um, really, really easily. Uh, and when I say easily, for example, here's the how to deploy on Zeit guide created by San Francisco study group member uh, Navjot. Uh, as you can see, it's, it's just a page. Um, there's almost nothing to do. Um, and it's free. Um, it's not going to serve uh, 10,000 uh, simultaneous requests, um, but it'll certainly get you started, and uh, I found it works really well. It's fast, um, and so deploy, you know, deploying a model doesn't have to be slow or complicated anymore. And the nice thing is you can kind of use this for an MVP, and if you do find you're starting to get 1,000 simultaneous requests, uh, then you know that things are working out, and you can start to, you know, um, upgrade your instance types or, you know, add to a more traditional, um, you know, big engineering approach. Uh, so if you uh, actually uh, use this starter kit, it will actually create um, uh, my teddy bear finder for you. Um, and this is an example of my teddy bear finder. So the idea is it's like it's as simple as possible, this template. So you can um, fill in your own style sheets, your own custom logic, and so forth. This is kind of designed to be a minimal thing so you can see exactly what's going on. The back end is a simple uh, kind of REST style, you know, uh, interface that sends back uh, JSON. And the front end is a super simple little uh, JavaScript thing. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, it should be a good way to get a sense of how to build a, a, a web app um, which talks to a PyTorch model. Um, so, examples of um, web apps people have built during the week. Um, Edward Ross uh, built the uh, What Car Is That uh, app, or more specifically, the What Australian Car Is, the, uh, is That. Um, I thought it was kind of interesting that Edward said on the forum that the building of the app uh, was actually a great experience in terms of understanding how, to, how the model works himself uh, better. Um, um, and like it's, it's, it's interesting that he's describing like trying it out on his phone. And a lot of people think like, oh, if I want something on my phone, I have to create some kind of mobile TensorFlow, ONNX, whatever, tricky mobile app. You really don't. You can run it all uh, in the cloud and make it just a web app or use kind of some kind of simple um, little GUI front end that talks to a, a REST back end. Um, it's not that often that you'll need to actually run stuff on the phone. So this is a good example of that. Um, uh, uh, C. Werner has created a uh, guitar classifier. Um, uh, you can decide whether your food is healthy or not. Apparently this one is healthy, that can't be right. I would have thought a hamburger is more what we're looking for, but there you go. Um, uh, apparently Trinidad and Tobago is the home of the hummingbird, so if you're visiting you can find out what kind of hummingbird you're looking at. 
uh, you can decide whether or not to eat a mushroom. Uh, if uh, you happen to be one of the cousins of Charlie Harrington, uh, you can now figure out who is who. I believe this was actually designed for his fiance. Uh, even will tell you uh, about uh, the interests of this particular cousin. So, you know, fairly niche application, but you know, apparently there are 36 people who will appreciate this at least. Um, I have no cousins. That's a lot of cousins. Um, this is an example of a, um, uh, an app which actually takes a video feed and turns it into a uh, motion classifier. Um, that's pretty cool. I like it. Um, team 26, good job. Um, uh, here's a similar one for um, American Sign Language. Um, and so, like, it, it's, it's not a big step from taking a single image uh, model to taking a, a, a video model. You can just grab the occasional frame, um, put it through your model, and, and update the, um, update the, the UI as, as the kind of model results come in. Uh, so it's really cool uh, that you can do this kind of stuff either in client or in browser nowadays. Um, uh, Henry Palachi has um, built uh, uh, your city from dot space, um, which he describes as creepy uh, how accurate it is. Um, so here is where I live, which it figured out was in the United States. Um, it's interesting, he describes here how he actually had to be very thoughtful about the validation set he built, make sure that the uh, satellite tiles were not overlapping or close to each other. Um, in doing so, he realized he had to download more data, but once he did, he got this uh, amazingly effective model that can look at satellite imagery and figure out what country it's from. Um, I thought this one was pretty interesting, which was doing um, a univariate time series analysis by converting it into a picture um, using um, uh, something I've never heard of, a Gramian angular field. Um, but uh, he says he's getting close to state-of-the-art results for univariate time series modeling by turning it into a picture. And so I like this, is, uh, I like this idea of turning stuff um, that's not a picture into a picture. Um, um, so something really interesting about this project, which was looking at um, uh, emotion classification from faces, uh, was that he was specifically asking the question, how well does it go without changing anything, just using the default settings? Which I think is a really interesting experiment because we we're all told it's really hard to train models and it takes a lot of, you know, specific knowledge. And actually we're finding that that's often not the case. And uh, he looked at this uh, facial expression recognition data set. There was a 2017 paper that he compared his results to and he got uh, equal or slightly better results than the state-of-the-art paper on face rec uh, uh, emotion recognition without doing any custom hyperparameter tuning at all. So that was really cool. And then Elena Harley, who um, uh, uh, I featured one of her works uh, last week, um, has done another really cool work in the genomic space. Um, which is looking at um, uh, 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 variant analysis, uh, looking at false positives um, uh, in these kinds of pictures. And uh, she found she was able to de decrease the number of false positives coming out of the kind of uh, industry standard software she was using by 500% um, by using uh, a deep learning workflow. Now, I think this is a nice example of something where if you're going through you know, spending hours every day looking at, at something, in this case looking at, uh, you know, kind of get rid of the false positives, maybe you can make that a lot faster by using deep learning to do a lot of the work for you. And again, this is an example of a computer vision-based approach on something which initially wasn't actually images. So that was, uh, yeah, that's a really cool application. So, um, really nice to see what people have been um, building uh, in terms of both web apps and just classifiers. What we're going to do today is look at a whole lot more different types of model that you can build. And we're going to kind of zip through them pretty quickly, and then we're going to go back and say like, oh, how did all these things work? What's the common denominator? Um, but all of these things, you can create web apps from these as well, um, but you'll have to think about how to slightly change that template to make it work with, with these different applications. I think that'll be a really good exercise in making sure you understand the material. Um, so the first one we're going to look at is a data set um, uh, of satellite images. 
And satellite imaging is a really uh, 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 fertile area for deep learning. Um, it's certainly a lot of people already uh, using deep learning and satellite imaging, but only scratching the surface. And the data set that we're going to look at um, looks like this. Um, it has uh, satellite uh, tiles. Um, and for each one, as you can see, there's a number of different labels for each tile. Um, one of the labels always, always represents the weather that's shown. So in this case, cloudy or partly cloudy. Um, and then all of the other labels tell you any interesting features that are, are seen there. So primary means primary rainforest. Um, agriculture means there's some farming, road, road, and so forth. So as I'm sure you can tell, this is a little different to all the classifiers we've seen so far, because there's not just one label, there's potentially multiple labels. So multi-label classification um, can be done in a very similar way. Um, but the first thing we're going to need to do is to download the data. Now this data comes from Kaggle. Uh, Kaggle is um, mainly known for being a competitions website, and it's really great to download data from Kaggle when you're learning, because you can see how would I have gone in that competition. And it's a good way to see whether you kind of know what you're doing. Um, I tend to think the goal is to try and get in the top 10%. Um, in my experience, all the people in the top 10% of a competition um, really know what they're doing. Uh, so if you can get in the top 10%, then, then that's a really good sign. Um, pretty much every Kaggle data set is not available for download outside of Kaggle, um, at least the competition data sets. So you have to download it through Kaggle. And the good news is that Kaggle provides a, a Python-based downloader tool, um, which you can use. So we've got a quick description here of how to download stuff from Kaggle. Um, so to install stuff, uh, to download stuff from Kaggle, you first have to install the, uh, the, the, the Kaggle download tool. So just pip install Kaggle. And so you can see what we tend to do when there's one-off things to do is we show you the commented out version in the notebook, and you can just remove the comment. So here's a cool tip for you. If you select a few lines and then hit control slash, it uncomments them all. And then when you're done, select them again, control slash again, and recomments them all, okay? So if you run this line, um, it'll install Kaggle for you. Um, depending on your platform, you may need sudo, you may need slash something else, slash pip, uh, you may need source activate. So have a look on the setup instructions, uh, or actually the, the returning to work instructions on the course website to see like when we do uh, Conda install, you have to do the same basic steps for your pip install. Um, so once you've got that module installed, um, uh, you can then go ahead and uh, download the data. And basically it's as simple as saying Kaggle competitions download, the competition name, um, and then the files that you want. Um, the only other steps before you do that is that you have to um, authenticate yourself, and uh, you'll see there's a little bit of information here on exactly how you can go about downloading from Kaggle the, the file containing your, your API authentication information. So I won't bother going through it here, um, but just follow these steps. Um, Sometimes uh, stuff on Kaggle is um, not just zipped or tarred, but it's compressed with a um, program called 7-zip, uh, which will have a 7-z um, extension. Um, if that's the case, you'll need to either um, apt install p7-zip, or and here's something really nice. Um, some kind person has actually created a Conda installation of 7-zip that works on every platform. Um, so you can always just run this Conda install. doesn't even require sudo or anything like that. Um, and this is actually a good example of where Conda is uh, super handy, is that you can actually install binaries and libraries and, and stuff like that, and it's nicely cross-platform. So that's a good, if you don't have 7-zip installed, that's a good way to get, get it. Um, and so this is how you uh, unzip uh, a 7-zip file. In this case, it's uh, tarred and 7-zipped, so you can do this all in one step. Um, so 7ZA is the name of the 7-zip archiver program that you would run. Okay, so that's all basic stuff, which um, if you're not so familiar with the command line and stuff, it might take you a little bit of experimenting to get it working. Feel free to ask on the forum. Make sure you uh, search the forum first um, uh, to get started. Okay, so once you've got the data downloaded and unzipped, um, you can take a look at it. 
So in this case, um, uh, so in this case, uh, because we have um, multiple labels for each uh, tile, we we clearly can't have a different folder for each image telling us what the label is. We need some different way to label it. And so the way that Kaggle did it was they provided a CSV file that had each file name along with a list of all of the labels. Um, in order to just take a look at that CSV file, we can read it using the pandas library. If you haven't used pandas before, it's kind of the standard way of dealing with uh, tabular data um, in, um, in Python. Uh, it pretty much always appears in the PD namespace. In this case, we're not really doing anything with it other than just showing you the contents of this file. Uh, so we can read it, we can take a look at the first few lines, and there it is. So uh, we want to turn this um, into something we can use for modeling. So the uh, kind of object that we use for modeling is an object of the data bunch class. Uh, so we have to somehow create a data bunch out of this. Uh, once we have a data bunch, we'll be able to go dot show batch to take a look at it, uh, and then we'll be able to go create CNN with it, and then we'll be able to start training. Okay. So really the, the, the trickiest step uh, previously in deep learning has often been getting your data into a form that you can get it into a model. So far, uh, we've been showing you how to do that using various um, factory methods. So methods where you basically say, I want to create this kind of data from this kind of source with these kinds of options. The problem is, I mean, that works fine sometimes, and we showed you a few ways of doing it uh, over the last couple of weeks. But sometimes uh, you want more flexibility because there's so many choices that you have to make about where do, where do the files live and what's the structure they're in and how do the labels appear and how do you split out the validation set and how do you transform it and so forth. So we've got this um, unique API that I'm really proud of called the data block API. And the data block API makes each one of those decisions a separate decision that you make. There's separate methods and with their own parameters for every choice that you make around how do I create you know, set up my data. So for example, um, to grab the planet data, we would say we've got a list of image files that are in a folder and they're labeled based on a CSV with this name. They have this separator. Remember I showed you back here that there's a space between them. So by passing in separator, it's gonna create multiple labels. The images are in this folder. They have this suffix. We're gonna randomly split out a validation set with 20% of the data. We're gonna create data sets from that, which we're then gonna transform with these transformations. And then we're gonna create a data bunch out of that, which we'll then normalize using these statistics. So there's all these different steps. So to give you a sense of um, what that looks like, um, the first thing I'm gonna do is kind of go back and explain what are all of the PyTorch and FastAI kind of classes that you need to know about um, that are gonna appear in this process, because you're, you're gonna see them all the time in the FastAI docs and the PyTorch docs. Um, so the first one you need to know about is a class called a data set. Um, and the data set class is part of PyTorch, and this is the source code for the data set class. As you can see, it actually does nothing at all. Um, um, so, um, the data set class in PyTorch um, defines two things, get item and len. Uh, in Python, these special things that are underscore, underscore something, underscore, underscore, Pythonistas call them uh, dunder something. So this would be dunder, get item, dunder, len. And they're basically special magical methods that do some special uh, behavior. Um, this particular method, you can look them up in the uh, Python docs. This particular method means that your object um, if you had an object called O, can be indexed with square brackets, something like that, right? So that would call get item with three as the index. And then this one called len means that you can go len O, and it will call that method. Now you can see in this case, they're both not implemented. So that is to say, although PyTorch says um, you, to, to tell, tell PyTorch about your data, you have to create a data set. It doesn't really do anything to help you 
create the data set. It just defines what the data set needs to do. So in other words, your data, the starting point for your data, is something where you can say, what is the third item of data in my data set? So that's what get item does, and how big is my data set? And that's what the length does. So FastAI has lots of data set subclasses that do that for all different kinds of stuff. And so, so far, you've been seeing um, image classification data sets. Um, so they're data sets where get item will return an image and a single label of what is that image. So that's what a data set is. Now, a data set is not enough to train a model. The first thing we know we, know we have to do, if you think back to the um, gradient descent tutorial last week, is we have to have a few images or a few items at a time so that our GPU can work in parallel. Remember we do this, this thing called a mini-batch. A mini-batch is a few items that we present to the model at a time that it can train from in parallel. So to create a mini-batch, we use another um, PyTorch, um, another PyTorch class called a data loader. And so a data loader takes a data set in its constructor, so it's now saying, oh, this is something I can get the third item and the fifth item and the ninth item, and it's gonna grab items at random and create a batch of whatever size you ask for and, pass, and pop it on the GPU and send it off to your model for you. Right? So a data loader is something that grabs individual items, combines them into a mini batch, pops them on the GPU for modeling. So that's called a data loader, and it comes from a data set. So you can see already there's kind of choices you have to make. You know, what kind of data set am I creating? What is the data for it? Where is it gonna come from? And then when I create my data loader, what batch size do I wanna use, right? This still isn't enough to train a model. Uh, not really because we've got no way to validate the model. If all we have is a training set, then we have no way to know how we're doing because we need a separate set of held out data, a validation set to see how we're getting along. So for that, we use a fast AI class called a data bunch. And a data bunch is something which, as it says here, binds together a training data loader and a valid data loader. And when you look at the um, fast AI docs, when you see these, um, kind of monospace font things, they're always referring to some symbol you can look up elsewhere. So in this case, you can see train DL is here. And there's no point knowing what an arg that, that there's an argument with a certain name with, unless you know what that argument is. So you should always look after the colon to find out that is a data loader. Okay, so when you create a data bunch, you're basically giving it a training set data loader and a validation set data loader and that's now an object that you can send off to a learner and start, start learning, start fitting. Right? So they're the basic pieces. So coming back to here, um, this stuff plus this line is all the stuff which cre is creating the data set. So it's saying where did the images come from? Because the data set, um, the indexer returns two things. It returns the, the image and the labels, assuming it's an image data set. So where do the images come from? Where do the labels come from? And then I'm gonna cre create two separate data sets, the training and the validation. This is the thing that actually turns them into PyTorch data sets. This is the thing that transforms them. Okay, and then this is actually gonna create uh, the, um, the data loader and the data bunch in one, in one go. So let's look at some examples of this data block API, because once you understand the data block API, you'll never be lost for how to convert your data set into something you can start modeling with. Um, so here's some examples of using the data block API. So for example, if you're looking at MNIST, which remember is the um, pictures and uh, classes of, of um, handwritten numerals, um, you can um, do something like this. This, what kind of data set is this gonna be? It's gonna be, an, it's gonna come from a, a, a list of image files, which are in some folder, and they're labeled according to the folder name that they're in. And then we're gonna split it into train and validation according to the folder that they're in, train and validation. Um, 
You can optionally add a test set. We're going to be talking more about test sets later in the course. Okay, we'll convert those into PyTorch data sets now that that's all set up. We'll then transform them using this set of transforms. And we're going to transform into something of this size and then we're going to convert them into a data bunch. So each of those stages inside these parentheses are various um, parameters you can pass to customize how that all works, right? But in the case of something like this MNIST data set, all the defaults pretty much work. So this is all fine. Um, so here it is. So you can check, let's grab something. So data.trainDS is the data set, not the data loader, the data set. So I can actually index into it with a particular number. So here is the zero indexed item in the training data set. It's got an image and a label. We can show batch to see an example of the pictures of it, and we could then start training. Here are the classes that are in that data set. And this uh, little cut down sample of MNIST just has threes and sevens. Um, here's an example using Planet. Um, this is actually, again, a sub little subset of Planet we use um, for, you know, make it easy to try things out. Um, so in this case, again, it's an image file list. Again, we're grabbing it from a folder. Um, this time we're labeling it based on a CSV file. We're randomly splitting it. By default, it's 20%. Creating data sets, transforming it using these transforms. We're going to use a smaller size and then create a data bunch. There it is. And so data bunches know how to draw themselves, amongst other things. So here's some more examples we're going to be seeing, some, uh, seeing later today. Um, what if we look at this data set called Canvid? Uh, Canvid looks like this. It contains pictures, and every pixel in the picture is color-coded, right? So in this case, we have a list of files in a folder, and we're going to label them, in this case, using a function. And so this function is basically the thing, we're going to see it later, which tells it whereabouts of the color coding for each pixel. It's in a different place. Um, randomly split it in some way, create some data sets in some way. Um, we can tell it um, for our particular list of classes, you know, how do we know what pixel you know, value one versus pixel value two is? And that was something that we can basically read in, like so. Um, again, some transforms. Um, create a data bunch, you can optionally pass in things like what batch size do you want, and again, it knows how to draw itself, and you can start learning with that. Or one more example, um, what if we wanted to create something like this? It has like bars and chair and remote control and book. Uh, this is called an object detection data set. So again, we've got a little minimal uh, COCO data set. COCO is kind of the most famous academic data set for object detection. Um, we can create it using the same process. Grab a list of files from a folder, label them according to this little function, randomly split them, create an object detection data set, uh, create a data bunch. In this case, as you'll learn when we get to object detection, you have to use generally smaller batch sizes or you'll run out of memory. Um, and uh, as you'll also learn, you have to use something called a collation function. And once that's all done, we can again show it, and here's our object detection data set. So you get the idea, right? So here's a really convenient notebook. Where will you find this? Ah, this notebook is the documentation. Remember how I told you that all of the documentation comes from notebooks? You'll find them in your FastAI repo in docs underscore source. So this, uh, which you can play with and experiment with inputs and outputs and try all the different parameters, uh, you will find the data block API examples of use. If you go to the documentation, here it is, the data block API examples of use. Right? So remember, everything that you want to use in FastAI, you can look it up in the documentation. So let's search data block API. Go straight there. And away you go. And so once you um, find some documentation that you actually want to try playing with yourself, just look up the name, data block, and then you can open up a notebook with the same name in the FastAI repo and play with it yourself. Okay. So um, that's a quick overview of this really uh, nice data block API. And there's lots of uh, documentation for all of the different ways you can label, uh, label inputs and split data and create data sets and so forth. 
Uh, and so that's what we're using for Planet. Okay, so we're using that API. You'll see, like, in the documentation, these, um, these two steps we had all joined up together. We can certainly do that here too, but um, you'll learn in a moment why it is that we're actually splitting these up into two separate steps, which is also fine as well. Um, so a few interesting points about this. Um, transforms. So transforms, uh, by default, 